I'm Daniel and this is EDH TV. Welcome to another Deck Tech video. Today I'm presenting you my EDH build for Jota, Archmage Eternal. This is a focused big spells deck, with a power level around of 7 on a scale of 1 to 10. Maybe a little better if you don't face blue players with permission decks. This deck is not meant to be played in a CEDH pod, and it's simply the list I'm playing in real life. So, it's built with the cards I own, which are many but not all. It doesn't want to be an advice on what you have to play. It's just an exposition and analysis of what I have chosen to play. Before start, I remind you that in description you can find the Archidect link for this list and for a budget-ish one. In addition, English is not my mother tongue. That's why I'm using a text-to-speech software. I'll try to answer to every comment at my best, and I'll read all of them for sure. Nevertheless, I apologize if my knowledge will seem rough sometimes. Joda, Archmage Eternal, in my imagination is simply Doctor Strange in the Wizard's version. But this has nothing to do with the deck, so let's start again. Joda, Archmage Eternal, is a 4-3 flying human wizard for a colorless, a blue, a red and a white. It has all five colors in his color identity, since he has an activated ability which reads, you may pay Wooburg rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. This ability allows us to cast any spell with a strong discount on mana, so we will base our strategy on that. Playing huge spells, cheating costs. Before starting to present the deck, I would like to clarify that this list was born exactly with the purpose just said. I know it's possible to abuse Joda in an incredible way. And this deck also contains huge plays that brutally abuse our commander ability. But I tried not to play only the same 10 cards present on every list with this commander. Sure, I play them too, I'm too greedy not to play them. But I still tried to include as many abominable spells as possible. You know, for variety reasons. But, this means that this deck isn't particularly optimized. It's a conscious choice. What we want is to continue playing huge spells until we break down the resistance of our opponents. Or we will die trying. It's a deck built for a light-ish meta, and it's really that easy. Tap the lands, play the spells, pray. The next deck that I will present on the channel, plays with mechanics very similar to Jota but in a less direct way. And it is much more concrete in pursuing your game plan. And in defending it. Okay, as always, let's start with the mana base. Since we are playing 5 colors we need as many colored lands as possible. So, we play Command Tower, Mana Confluence and City of Brass. And Forbidden Orchard, Exotic Orchard and Reflecting Pool. Then we play 5 fetch lands. Now, I've listed the 5 cheaper ones, but any 5 fetch lands are fine. And we play the 10 shock lands. I repeat it every time, but I repeat it again. By personal choice, I play the original dual lands only in CEDH decks. In all other cases I choose not to include them. And then, we play the 5 bond lands, which enter untapped but are not fetchable. I still haven't really tried the 5 triumphs, yet. I know that they enter the battlefield tapped, but each one can be tapped for 3 colors and each one has 3 basic types, so they are fetchable. And 5 tap lands out of 36 total lands wouldn't be too bad, after all, in a focused field. And, honestly, I don't like to leave them in the binder. I want to play them somewhere. But, since I received some criticism for suboptimal mana bases, I remind you that if you don't like this mana base you are very free to do as you please. I encourage you to take my decks as ideas, certainly not as copy-paste lists. In particular, if you don't like to play tap lands you can simply change these with 5 other lands. Before the triomes, I was playing 5 filter lands in these slots. And finally, we play only one basic snow land of each type. If, in your meta, blood moon or back to basics are popular, probably it's better for you to remove the 5 triomes adding 5 more basics here. At least. But, in my meta, the worst effect against non-basic land is Talia, Heretic Cathar. Playing non-basic lands, in the meta where I play this deck, is not a problem. In this deck, knowing my meta, I'm more afraid of effects that destroys artifacts, rather than one that destroys lands. So, I chose to focus mainly on effects that make us ramp lands. So we play Rampant Growth, Farseek and Sakura Tribe Elder. And also into the North and Nature's Lore. Farseek and Nature's Lore, in particular, allow us to search also for non-basic lands. 
We will always use them to fetch triomes. Since we are playing only 5 basic lands, it's important to fetch for non-basic lands whenever possible, since we may find ourselves having no targets. Speaking about rocks, we play Arcane Signet and Felwar Stone. Both these cards can be tapped for a choice of colored mana. And we play Chromatic Lantern, because even if it costs 3 mana, every time we play it we immediately resolve all our mana problems. And then we play Birds of Paradise, because it's the best mana dork of the game, and Bloom Tender. Bloom Tender will not help us much to cast Joda, since in the first few turns he taps only for a green mana. But, with our commander on the table, we can automatically tap it for 4 mana of 4 different colors. This dork is amazing. After this quick overview on the cards that accelerate our starts, let's see the excluded ones, because there is a lot to say about it. And I think many may be critical or skeptical in front of my choices. We don't play Sol Ring or Mana Crypt. Please, don't turn off the video now. As for how the deck is built, we have no particular need to have double colorless mana in the early turns. I'm not saying it's useless, because obviously extra mana is always precious. But we have a desperate need to get to the third turn with four different colored mana and play the fifth color in the next turn. In order to start activating our commander from turn 4. So I chose less explosive, more controlled accelerations. I played Noble Hierarch for a while in the deck before buying Bloom Tender, but I preferred the latter because, in some cases, on turn 6 or 7 it allows me to activate Jota twice in a turn. So, no more Noble Hierarch. I chose not to play Dockside Extortionist. Since this deck is built for a focused meta, it's not guaranteed that our pirate friend will give us dozens of treasures. And even if it were, we have to keep in mind that treasures are one-shot mana generators which disappears after use. In a similar way, I've decided to exclude Smothering Tithe. Our commander has the same CMC of this enchantment, and this leads to an annoying overlap. Of course, Smothering Tithe remains an amazing card. It would potentially allow us, by delaying Joda's cast by one turn, to use our commander's ability much more often. But it's a 4 mana drop, which is a great sacrifice for a ramp card. Although every time I play this deck I think that, in the end, a slot to include Smothering Tithe would be easy to find. Finally, no carpet of flowers. In this case it's easy to explain. We have no mana fixers, and the carpet gives us a lot of mana, but all of the same color. The bottom line of this whole discussion is that we play a deck that cheats the mana costs. We don't need a lot of mana, we need relatively little, but quality. That is, of all colors. We want to draw cards. So many cards. Each player in EDH just wants to draw many cards, to have access to as many choices as possible. To develop his game plan. We are no exception. And so, since we have blue in our color identity, we play Rhystic Study, Consecrated Sphinx and Mystic Remora. And I will never tire of saying it. These cards are the best generic drawing engines of the entire format. Give up on a dinner at a restaurant, ask for a loan from a loan shark or sell a kidney on the black market, but get these cards if you don't already have them. Of course I'm kidding. Kinda. And here comes our first big spells. Sire of Stagnation is a 5-7 Eldrazi for 4, a blue and a black. It's another amazing draw engine since it draws 2 cards every time a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control. And, in addition, it also exiles the top two cards from our opponent's libraries. And, you know, people hates to have their cards exiled. Then Isperia, Supreme Judge. This is a 6-4 Flying Sphinx for two colorless, white-white-blue-blue. Blue. She has. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, you may draw a card. Then we have our first bringer. Bringer of the Blue Dawn. This is a 5-5 trampling bringer for 7 colorless and double blue. I don't exactly know what a bringer is, but it's something we can cast for Wooburg, even without our commander in play. And, thanks to it, at the beginning of our upkeep, we can draw 2 cards. And finally our first Myojin. Myojin of Seeing Winds. This is a 3-3 spirit for 7 and triple blue. It comes into play with a divinity counter on it, and it's indestructible as long as it has the divinity counter on it. But, we can remove the divinity counter at instant speed, drawing a card for each permanent we control. We don't play so many drawing engines, and there are certainly others that we could easily add if we wanted. But we play tutors. 
Demonic Tutor and Vampiric Tutor are simply the best tutors in the game and we absolutely want them in our deck. Because even at an unoptimized level, consistency is important. Then we play Academy Rector. This is a 1-2 human cleric for 3 and a white. When Academy Rector dies, you may exile it. If you do, search your library for an enchantment card, put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. We will almost never be able to use the Academy Rector's ability, because he will usually be exiled as soon as possible. But in any case, a removal on him is one less on our commander. Let's try to see it from a positive point of view. Anyway, having Academy Rector on the battlefield often means we will receive no more attacks from creatures without flying. And, trust me, as we'll see later they'd better avoid killing him. And then our second and last bringer. Bringer of the Black Dawn, which is a 5-5 bringer for 7 and double black. But we can play it paying Wooberg, even without our commander in play. At the beginning of our upkeep we can pay 2 life and search our library for a card, put that card on top of our library. So, it's a vampiric tutor at the beginning of each of our turns. And then we have Tooth and Nail. This sorcery for 5 and double green is modular, and we can choose between two options. Search your library for two creatures, reveal them and add them to our hand. Or, put two creatures from our hand to the battlefield. This spell also has entwined so, if we pay two extra colorless mana, we can choose both. Tutor two creatures, put them into play. For seven mana total. Wooberg and two colorless. Not bad, especially if you think at what kind of creatures we play in the deck. We have no immediate auto-win combos to tutor with tooth and nail, but the amount of value we can squeeze from this card is incredible. And then we have Conflux, which we will elaborate on later. 3 colorless and Wooberg for a sorcery which reads. Search your library for a white card, a blue card, a black card, a red card and a green card. Reveal those cards and put them into our hand. So, we can tutor 5 cards for 5 mana using our commander's ability. Removals. This is another section on which I imagine there could be complaints. There are many cards that are perhaps suboptimal, if you don't look at them from the perspective of wanting, in addition to removing something, also putting something huge into play. If you want to optimize the list, I'll say it clearly, you can probably remove all the next 7 cards. And you can replace them with the usual swords to plowshares, path to exile, assassin's trophy, abrupt decay, supreme verdict, and so on. Because these which I have just mentioned, are simply better cards. This deck, with my list, is totally unprepared against commanders like Gaddock Teague, for example. Angel of Despair is a 5-5 flying angel for 3, white white, black black. It has recently been downgraded to uncommon. A clear sign of how the level of power from the cards has grown faster and faster in recent years. Which is exactly why playing a deck like Joda, when Angel of Despair enters the battlefield, destroy target permanent. Then, Angel of Serenity. It's a 5-6 flying angel for 4 and triple white. When Angel of Serenity enters the battlefield, you may exile up to 3 other target creatures from the battlefield or from graveyards. When it leaves the battlefield, return the exiled cards to their owner's hands. And then Ashen Rider, a 5-5 flying archon for 4, double white and double black. When Ashen Rider enters the battlefield or dies, exile target permanent. Then we have Terrastodon. This is a 9-9 elephant for 6 colorless and 2 green. When it enters the battlefield, you may destroy up to 3 target non-creature permanents. For each permanent put into a graveyard this way, its controller creates a 3-3 green elephant creature token. Finally, Nickel Bolas, Planeswalker. This is a 5 loyalty planeswalker for 4, blue, black black, red. Its plus 3 ability can destroy target non-creature permanent. Fine, that's why it was placed in this category. Then, its minus 2 ability steal a creature. Not until the end of turn. Not until he leaves the battlefield. We can take an opposing commander and simply keep him. And it also has a minus 9 ability which is actually almost negligible and I've never really used it. It deals 7 damage to target player, discard 7 cards, sacrifice 7 permanents. In a multiplayer game you have to hate that specific opponent a lot to use this ability. Then we have 2 board wipes. In Garuk's Wake is a sorcery for 7 and double black. Destroy all creature you don't control and all planeswalkers you don't control. 
nice, and ruinous ultimatum, which is also a sorcery, but it costs double red, triple white and double black. It looks expensive and specific, but it actually costs Wooburg. Destroy all nonland permanents your opponents control. As for protections we play Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots. Fairly obvious choices. And then Blazing Archon. This is a 5-6 Flying Archon for 6 and triple white. Creatures can't attack you. Now, being a deck for a non-optimized meta, combo decks are not that frequent. And preventing opponents from attacking can be an excellent defensive move. Okay, now let's talk about the real core of the deck. Cheat costs. We play huge things. We want to be sure that we can play them with a discount. Or, why not, totally for free. Fist of Suns is an artifact for 3 colorless. It does exactly the same thing as our commander, but it's an artifact, so it's less vulnerable. Then we have Defense of the Heart. It's an enchantment for 3 and a green. At the beginning of our upkeep, if an opponent controls three or more creatures, we can sacrifice it and search our library for two creatures, put them directly onto the battlefield. Just an anticipation. One of the two targets could be Muldrotha, which would allow us to recycle this enchantment from the graveyard every turn. Elvish Piper is a 1-1 Elf Shaman for three and a green. We can tap it with a green mana to put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield. Now, I have always considered this card a secondary option, despite the evident very strong ability. For some reason, though, my opponents seem to regard this creature as a deadly threat and rage absurdly against it. Does it just happen to me? Is it just my impression? Then we have Lurking Predators, which is an enchantment for 4 colorless and 2 green. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, we can reveal the top card of our library. If it's a creature card we can put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise we can put that card on the bottom of our library. Maelstrom Archangel is a 5-5 Flying Angel for Wooburg. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player we may play a nonland card from our hand without paying its mana cost. And then, Aminatu's Augury. This is an 8 mana sorcery, 6 colorless and double blue, which reads. Exile the top 8 cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield. Until end of turn, for each nonland card type, you may cast a card of that type from among the exiled cards without paying its mana cost. Then we play Golos, Tireless Pilgrim. It's a 3-5 artifact scout for 5 colorless. When it enters the battlefield we can search our library for a land and put it into play tapped. Then, for 2 in Wooburg, we can exile the top 3 cards of our library and play them without paying their mana cost. This is an amazing creature. It fix our mana and also can cheat things into play. And, spoiler alert, it's the commander I will tell you about in the next video. As you can see, it shares a lot with Joda's strategy. We play 2 more ultimatums in the deck. Brilliant ultimatum is the Esper 1. We can remove the top 5 cards of our library from the game. An opponent separates those cards into two piles and we may play any number of cards from one of those piles without paying their mana costs. If you are unlucky like me, every time you cast this spell, you will reveal at least four lands. An emergent ultimatum, the Sultai ultimatum. We can search our library for three monocolored cards. Then, an opponent chooses one of those cards, and we shuffle that card into our library. We may cast the other two cards without paying their mana costs. Again, we don't have an auto-win combo with this card. But we have some interesting pile we can take that it's almost an auto-win. What about Omniscience, Tooth and Nail, and, In Garuk's Wake? Or maybe you prefer Omniscience, Aminatu's Augury, and, Academy Rector. Or Omniscience, whatever you like, whatever you like? There are even better choices later, but I preferred to avoid anticipation. Okay. Have I told you we play Omniscience? 7 and triple blue for an enchantment which says. You may cast spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. Yes, I know, it's a fun, fair and legit card. Everyone's favorite. And so our Omniscience and Conflux 18 mana combo is completely revealed. How does it works? If we play Omniscience using Joda's ability, now we can cast Conflux for free and go directly to the full combo, explained later. Otherwise, Omniscience is not strictly necessary, because we can cast Conflux with Joda's ability, and use it to get Omniscience as the blue card. But in that case we need to wait until the next turn, unless we have another 5 mana to complete the combo. 
Let's start by saying that if the opponents have allowed us to use our combo, perhaps, even if it's not entirely certain, it's because they have run out of responses to our threats. We will tutor Sunbird's invocation as the red card. It's an enchantment for 5 and a red which says. Whenever you cast a spell from your hand, reveal the top X cards of your library, where X is that spell's converted mana cost. You may cast a card revealed this way with converted mana cost X or less without paying its mana cost. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Basically every time we cast a spell we get another one for free. As the black card we can take the black Myojin. Myojin of Knight's Reach, a 5-2 spirit for 5 and triple black. As for the blue one, it comes into play with a divinity counter and it's indestructible as long as it has that counter on it. If we remove the counter each opponent will be forced to discard the whole hand. If the threat that we fear most is the board of our opponents, not their hands, we can instead take Ruinous Ultimatum to clean the table from any opponent's permanent. Oh, and don't forget the Sunbird's Invocation trigger when you cast the Myojin slash Ultimatum. For white we can take Avacyn, Angel of Hope. Trigger Sunbird's Invocation and then we have this 8-8 Flying, Vigilant, Indestructible Angel that give Indestructible to all our other permanents. Then, the green one, Archetype of Endurance. This 6-5 boar give hexproof to all our creatures. And it's another Sunbird's Invocation trigger. Just to make it fast. But we can easily take Tooth and Nail as the green card. So we cast Tooth and Nail, triggering Sunbird, then resolve it to take the archetype and another creature. Then cast both this creatures, triggering Sunbird for each one. In fact, after removing the Myojin's Divinity counter, this protection shouldn't be needed, and we could probably decide to take another green creature. There are many options, I'm just presenting you an example. Anyway, at this point we proceed to play every other card we have in hand, with further triggers of our red enchantment. Finally, we will launch the blue card tutored. Maelstrom Wanderer. A 7-5 elemental for 5 blue red green. Sunbird's invocation trigger. Cascade. Cascade again. And now all of our creatures have haste, and there are usually enough of them to shot the table. But very often opponents scoop long before we get into the combat phase. Now, if we only have Conflux in our hand, and we don't have Omniscience, we can tutor it using the blue slot of Conflux. Or, alternatively, we can use the black slot to take Vampiric Tutor, placing Omniscience on top of the deck and drawing it the next turn, without our opponents knowing what we put on top of our library. As in almost all of my non-optimized decks, it's a combo that is far to be invincible, but super fun and explosive if the opponents don't have an immediate answer. Note that we have no counter or way to protect it. But, again, the purpose of the deck is to be a deck that makes huge plays, while remaining playable on a medium level table. If you want to add cards to protect the combo, you can find plenty of cards in my list that you can change for counter spells or whatever you like. Okay, let's talk about big spells. Our idea is that every card with a 5 CMC or higher is incisive to the point of requiring opponents to neutralize it. Sooner or later, counters and removals will run out. Until that moment we'll try to drop bomb after bomb. We play Void Winnower, which is our only Eldrazi. This is a 11-9 Eldrazi for 9 colorless which prevents our opponents from playing spells with even mana costs. And also from block with creatures with an even CMC. This creature is very annoying. It often allows us to peek at what our opponents have in their hand, since they regularly forgot our effect, or make mistakes and try to cast spells with an even cost. Then, Kervek, the Merciless. This is a 5-4 legendary human shaman for 5, a black and a red. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, he deals damage to any target equal to that spell's converted mana cost. Since we want to be the cutest and most loved ones at the table, we play Jin Gataxis, Kor Augur. This is a legendary 5-4 Praetor with flash, for 8 and double blue. At the beginning of our end step, we'll draw 7 cards. Each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by 7. This creature is extremely annoying. Then Vorinclex, Voice of Hunger. This is a 7-6 trampling legendary Praetor for 6 and double green. It doubles the mana production of our lands and, whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. As you can see, I wasn't kidding when I said that our opponents will want to neutralize or remove everything we play. And then him. Nickel Bolas, God Pharaoh. This is a Bolas Planeswalker, with a starting loyalty of 7, for 4 blue black red. 
Let's go read his abilities quickly. Plus 2, target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a nonland card. Until end of turn, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Playing this against an opponent with Narset as commander, and revealing time stretch, is absolutely priceless. Plus 1. Each opponent exiles 2 cards from their hand. Good value. Minus 4. Nickel Bolas, God Pharaoh deals 7 damage to target opponent, creature an opponent controls, or planeswalker an opponent controls. Almost useless, but it's still a removal. Minus 12. Exile each nonland permanent your opponents control. I've never used it. And here we are, the cards that everyone loves. Time stretch, 10 mana for 2 extra turns, and expropriate, 9 mana to try and win the game. Almost. You normally receive a bunch of permanents in an extra turn, but if you're lucky enough, just 2 extra turns are amazing. In my playgroup there is a player which plays Aloro. Sometimes his life is totally out of control and, so, Magister Sphinx is very good, resetting his life back to 10. Then we have Sphinx of the Steel Wind. This is a 6-6 artifact creature Sphinx for 5 white blue black. It has flying, first strike, vigilance, lifelink and protection from red and from green. It's almost useless, except for the fact that as an amazing blocker against some decks, and it gains us a lot of life. Then, of course, Progenitus. Our favorite 10-10 legendary Hydra avatar for 10 mana, 2 of each color. It has protection from everything. And so it's a good defender and an equally good attacker. And finally, Zakama, Primal Calamity. It's a recent addition. I inserted it after trying it accidentally, randomly putting it on the battlefield from an opponent's library with Nicol Bolas God Pharaoh. It's an amazing combat machine and we can use its abilities to remove annoying artifacts or enchantments. We have four cards that are not part of any of the categories seen so far. Prismatic Omen is an enchantment for one and a green. Our lands are every basic land type in addition to other types. No more mana problems to get Wooburg. And Zendikar Resurgent is also an enchantment, but for 5 and double green. It doubles the mana production of our lands and, whenever we cast a creature spell, we draw a card. Then, Muldrotha, the Gravitide. This is a 6-6 elemental avatar for 3, a black, a green and a blue. It's a powerful recursion effect, since it has an ability which reads. During each of your turns, you may play up to one permanent card of each permanent type from your graveyard. If your opponents manage to destroy Omniscience and are finally calm, it's fun to see their faces when you play this creature. Finally, Tenab, the Harvester. It's here because I'm sorry I took away his commanding role. He once had his own deck, and I was sorry to leave him in the binder. But it's a quite good card, trust me. It's a 6-6 flying dragon for 6 total mana and, whenever it deals combat damage, we may pay 2 and a black to reanimate a creature from a graveyard to our battlefield. There are a lot of big spells that I'm not playing here, in most cases because I already play them in other decks. Insurrection, which I play in my Grixis Marquesa deck. Rise of the Dark Realms, which I play in Erebos. Blightsteel Colossus, which I play in Urza. Kozilek and Ulamog, which I plan to purchase after the summer. Zatalpa, which I consider a stupid overrated creature and I don't want to play at all. And many others. But this deck is a great excuse to play cards that would otherwise hardly be played elsewhere. And still, I'll repeat, if I had to improve or optimize the deck, the first step would be to remove big spells, not add them. Adding instead 6 to 8 counter spells and 5 or more quick low cost interactions. Just to start. And, probably, adding some kind of combo for infinite turns or infinite combat phases. But in the end, it would become the same as many other decks. And, at that point, why choose Joda, instead of other better performing 5 colors commanders? So, to recap. I know, this deck is just a bunch of big spells put together, but it's fun to play on a relaxing evening with friends, and it's not too complex or demanding. Take it for what it is, a for fun deck. I hope you have enjoyed this deck tech. If you like what I'm doing, and you want to help the channel, please, click the thumb to like the video, share it, subscribe or leave a comment. Thank you everyone. I'm Daniel, this is EDHTV, and I really hope to see you next time.